Hi there, my name is Mike Sullivan. I'm the Program Director of Ballard Medical Services. I'd like to welcome you to this presentation from our series of continuing education for pre-hospital providers. Now, before we begin, there's a few things we need to go over. First off, the information presented in this program is intended for use by trained EMS providers. Also, due to variations in protocols and scope of practice among different states, departments, and agencies, this program may discuss or depict procedures, medications that are not acceptable in your daily use. If you see something in this presentation that varies from your agency's policy, always follow your department's protocols. Also, none of our authors or presenters of this program have any conflicts of interest or financial relationships they need to disclose. We do have documentation of this on file available in our office upon request. While we do our best to make sure that all the content we present is the most current available, participants are reminded that medicine is indeed a dynamic science and thus changes rapidly. So things may have changed since we've written or compiled this program. Please always follow the most up-to-date information available. In closing, if you have any questions about this or any of our other programs, please email us at info at ValorMed.net. Thank you very much and welcome to the program. Alrighty, now that we've got all that legal stuff out of the way, before we get started, let's talk about coffee for a second. If you're looking for a great cup of coffee, you probably want to check out coffeebrandcoffee.com. They're an online retailer, American owned and operated. They have a wide variety of coffees, teas, hot cocos, all sorts of different flavors. They've got all sorts of organic teas. You can get coffee in bean form, ground form, K cups, whatever the your heart desires. I've had several of the different blends and several of the different flavors. Absolutely fantastic. And because they are an American-owned small business, they don't have a big warehouse, so they don't have a big supermarket sales business. They roast it, they bag it, they ship it to you. It'll pretty much be some of the freshest stuff you'll ever get. Definitely highly recommend them. And they've got a promo code out for us now. If you use promo code Valor SDS, you get a 5% discount off any order. So you can save a little money, try some fresh coffee, see what you like. They've always got different flavors coming through on their website. Some are permanent, some are limited time only. And if you look right there in the picture, you can see they've even got, yes, double caffeinated. Definitely a winner around this office. Alrighty, now let's get to class. Hi there, my name is Mike Sullivan and I'm one of the instructors at Valor Medical Services. In this presentation, we'll be discussing the pre-hospital care of the neonate. Now, as we embark on this, we're going to talk about the different steps that are involved in a pre-hospital delivery. We'll start in the pre-delivery phase, then delivery, then post-delivery and potentially neonatal resuscitation. We'll discuss the changes in the neonate that occur as it leaves the uterus. We'll discuss factors associated with an increased risk of neonatal depression. We'll differentiate between primary and secondary apnea in the neonate. We'll develop and discuss a treatment plan for apnea in the neonate. We'll identify commonly used equipment in the care of the neonate. We'll also discuss criteria that we can use to determine if a woman in labor should be transported or delivery should be attempted at home. We'll also discuss transport destination choices, whether it be in a hospital with a NICU or a local community hospital that may have less resources but be more readily available. We'll review the criteria that should be used to evaluate a neonate post-delivery. We'll develop an effective management plan for newly born patients. We'll determine and discuss when to use the following interventions on a newborn, whether it be blow by oxygen, ventilatory assistance with a bag valve mask, chest compressions, intubation, or potentially vascular access. Now, as we embark on this discussion, we need to keep a few things in perspective. Childbirth is a totally normal and natural process. It's gone on for years prior to the advent of paramedics, EMTs, or EMS as a whole. As a matter of fact, in 2017, there was an NIH study done. There were 62,000 out-of-hospital deliveries. That's one out of 62 babies delivered were done in a non-hospital setting. In fact, in most deliveries, the mother will do most of the work, and we're there to support her efforts. So remember, this is not that abnormal of a situation that we're faced with if we have to do it at home. 
Now, if you're faced with a resuscitation situation, especially with a neonate, pre-planning and preparation can pay immeasurable dividends. This is undoubtedly a very high-stretch situation for all providers. Fortunately, it's not one that we have every shift. But by planning a little bit in advance and rehearsing a little bit in advance, we can make it go easier. And while most deliveries will proceed easily, there are many potential risk factors that will increase the risk that we will end up with a complication or a neonatal resuscitation. Identifying those and working through what we may need to do may help us in advance. One of the key aspects to preparation for a home delivery is evaluating the patient and the whole situation for the presence of these risk factors, identifying as many of them as we can, and preparing in case we need to work further into a resuscitation phase. So let's look at the phases of the fetal transition process. We'll start with the intrauterine phase. While in utero, the oxygen needed for the fetus is supplied by the mother. It comes across via the placenta and the umbilical cord. The alveoli are open, but they're still full of liquid. The production of this liquid will dramatically decrease in the third trimester in preparation for delivery. By the time delivery begins, it should be down by about one-third of the total volume of the alveoli. Throughout the delivery, as the child passes through the birth canal, they're squeezed. This forces more of the liquid out of the lungs, so it gets about another third out. So now we're down two-thirds, or have one-third the volume roughly remaining. In extrauterine life, when the neonate takes their first breath, they pull air into the lungs. As the lungs fill with air for the first time, the pressure will begin to drive the remaining fluid out of the lungs into the pulmonary vasculature. Breathing will become progressively easier as more and more of the fluid leaves the lungs, and the lungs will fill with air, and the pulmonary vessels dilate, thus allowing blood flow to increase, carrying this lung liquid away. The umbilical vessels will contract. Blood flow through the ductus arterius will cease, and the newborn will begin to pink up. That's assuming that everything goes well. Now, there are some potential problems we may see in the fetal transition process. For example, if the newborn doesn't provide enough effort to force the fluid from the lungs, or if meconium is blocking air from entering the alveoli. Poor blood return from the placenta will cause hypotension and may also cause hypoxia. Poor cardiac contractility can also decrease blood flow and thus prevent the baby from actually pinking up the way we would expect. Bradycardia may happen due to either cardiac or cerebral hypoxia. This, again, contract, uh, combined with poor cardiac contractility, will definitely lead to poor perfusion, poor circulation, and again, then we'll have lack of oxygen to the muscles, poor muscle tone, which would be less respiratory effort and less tidal volume. Any one or all of these or a combination thereof can lead to the baby having problems in the transition from the intrauterine to the extrauterine life. Now let's look at the stages of labor. The first stage of labor is from the onset or beginning of contractions until the mother is fully dilated, roughly 10 centimeters. This may be 8 to 12 hours long. And many times it will vary based on the mother's previous history. If this is her first child, we would expect it to take longer. If this is her fifth or sixth child, we'd expect it to be much shorter. In the second stage of labor, this is from when the mother is fully dilated until the fetal delivery is completed. This may be from 30 minutes up to about two hours. Mom has been dilated and now she started to expel the baby. Once the delivery is completed, we then move to the third stage of labor, from fetal delivery until the placenta is delivered. Usually this will be within about 30 to 40 minutes in most cases, and it really does not vary as much on multiple births as much as the earlier ones would. Now, when we're evaluating mom, we're called to the scene of a delivery or possible delivery or OB complications. We'll have two key objectives. First, assess and evaluate the patient's status to determine her immediate needs. What does the mom need? What does she need now? We'll triage the delivery to determine our best course of action. 
Now, these objectives will be based on both the subjective and objective assessment of the patient. Subjective being what she's telling us, and objective assessment being things that we might observe. For example, crowning, or mother stating she needs to move her bowels, would be subjective. We'll initiate care as we would with any other patient with a primary survey. Airway, breathing, circulation, and disability or level of consciousness. In our secondary survey of mom, we'll start getting our baseline routine vital signs, we'll do our sample history as we would for any other medical patient, and then we'll begin our focus history and physical. This will largely center on OB-related questions. We'll evaluate and look for different risk factors. We'll also perform a physical exam to check for crowning. As we get through all this information and we've asked our questions, we'll begin to develop some sort of a delivery plan. Is this going to be something we have to deliver here at home? Is it going to be something that we think can be handled at a local hospital? Is this something we may need to go to a specialty hospital that may have surgical capability or may have a NICU available or something along those lines? What are our resources available locally and at a further distance? What's our best choice for where mom delivers? You'll note on there, it's not listed delivering in the truck. Quite honestly, from my experience, delivering in the truck is the worst possible option. If I'm not pretty sure that I can make it to the local hospital or to a specialty hospital, I don't want to get caught halfway between trying to deliver in the truck. I'd rather stay and do it at the house. Most of us have limited room in the back of our ambulances, and while they have lots of equipment, we have very limited room, limited access to mom, and limited personnel in the back of the truck. We can probably do a lot more here at the house and have more people available to take care of mom and the baby than we would if we're halfway to the hospital stuck on the side of the highway or stuck in bumper to bumper traffic. Now, when we evaluate mom, we're going to ask several key questions. The first of which, how many times has the mother been pregnant? That would be gravita. The second question we'll have is how many live births has she had? That would be para. Next question is the due date. Does mom know and how reliable is the due date? If the baby is due in a day or so, we think, well, the baby's full term. If we have to go to a hospital, we'll likely go to a local one. However, if the baby is due two to three months from now, oh, that would be something that definitely needs a NICU. And while a local hospital may be close, if we can make it to a hospital with higher level of care that might have a NICU available and more specialty equipment available, the baby may be better served at that facility. Has mom's water broken already? If it has, that would indicate a pretty imminent delivery. As far as mom's prenatal care, has she had any? Again, how recent? Was there a delivery plan in place? A delivery plan may be something as simple as the doctor stating, everything looks great, the baby has rotated, and if you haven't delivered by next Friday, we may have to consider inducing you. Or it may be something as, well, given your previous deliveries and the multiple complications, I really don't think a vaginal delivery would be good, so we may have to do a C-section. Or what if the doctor told her, for example, that where the placenta is is largely blocking the birth canal and they won't be able to deliver vaginally at all and it's almost guaranteed to need a C-section? Definitely things we should know as soon as possible. Now, we'll look at the timing and the duration of the mother's contractions. The closer together and more frequent they are, the sooner the baby's going to be delivered. What do we know about the fetal positioning, or what can mom tell us about baby activity? Has the baby been actively kicking all day and she still feels it? Or has the, fetal, has the fetus not been kicking or she hasn't felt any movement for three hours? That would be a little bit more concerning. Now, does mom know the number of fetuses? I know this may seem like a stupid question, but if she hasn't had any prenatal care, could we be expecting twins and not know it? What would that do to our resources and our personnel if all of a sudden, whoop, there's a second baby coming? Yeah, these are things we'd want to know as soon as possible in advance. If mom has no idea whether she has one or two babies and she hasn't had any prenatal care, it doesn't hurt to ask if twins run on the family. These are things you might want to keep in your mind. 
Now, some of the risk factors in the pre-delivery arena that we can identify. What's the maternal age? Is the mom over 35 or under 16? Is the mother been having significant bleeding in the second or third trimester? Now, a little bit of minor bleeding or spotting in the first trimester can be very normal. But if we're having significant hemorrhage in the second or third trimester, that would be of concern to us. What do we know about mom's medical history or what meds she's taking? Has mom got a history of anemia, cardiac history, or blood pressure history? Is mom diabetic? Does she have gestational diabetes? That would tend to lead toward larger birth weight. Does mom have any type of pulmonary issues or thyroid issues? Has mom been involved with any type of substance abuse? How about any substances taken in the last four to six hours? Is mom on any meds, such as lithium or magnesium? These would also potentially complicate delivery. Is this a post-term gestation? Meaning, mom was supposed to deliver last week. Okay, this baby could be large for birth weight. If mom is particularly small framed, that can make life a little bit difficult. Again, multiple gestations, as I stated on the last slide, if mom knows, Multiple gestations, we'll talk about later, but they bring a few risk factors with them. If mom has had no or poor prenatal care, let's say she found out she was pregnant and went to the doctor, you know, the last time six months ago. Okay, we're not going to know a lot then. Either diminished or lack of fetal activity would definitely be a big red flag for us to lead us to think we've got a high possibility of a complication. Has mom had previous delivery complications, and how many of these were based on her anatomy? For example, the baby's head not fitting through her pelvis. Well, if her anatomy was a problem before, and she hasn't had a successful delivery vaginally since then, could it be a problem now? Is this something to take into account? Most certainly. Now, when we look at our intra-delivery risk factors... The big one on the top is abruptio placenta. This is where the placenta begins to tear away from the uterine wall early. And once it tears away prematurely, it may actually cause significant hemorrhage. Placenta privia, as I mentioned before, is where the placenta is implanted over the cervical opening, either partially or completely obscuring the birth canal. If the birth canal is blocked, closed, or blocked in such a way with the placenta that we're not going to be able to deliver vaginally, that would preclude an at-home delivery. Is the baby premature, significantly premature? Now, a week early is one thing, two months early is another. Are we potential having precipitous labor? This is where labor proceeds so quickly that the baby comes out and can potentially injure mom or cause mom to rip in the delivery. Have we had a failure to rupture the membranes? In this case, the membranes are still covering the baby's nose and mouth, and it will require additional care from us to tear the membranes away or the bag of waters away from the baby's mouth and allow it to breathe. Anytime we have prolonged labor, whether overall greater than 24 hours or a second stage that's greater than 2 hours, this would increase the risk of a resuscitation. If we have a breach or abnormal presentation, would definitely increase the risk of a resuscitation. Fetal bradycardia. Most times, if the baby's heart rate is starting to drop suddenly, especially prior to delivery, this would indicate potential fetal hypoxia or fetal distress, both of which would lead to a high risk of resuscitation. Now, if we have a prolapse cord during the delivery, this is where the cord extends out of the vaginal opening. We'll have pictures of it later, but we have to make sure that the cord doesn't get clamped or crimped or occluded and thus keep the baby from getting needed oxygen during delivery. If we have meconium staining of the amniotic fluid, has the mother had to have a forceps or vacuum assisted delivery in the past? Has mother had to have an emergency C-section in the past? Not a scheduled or planned C-section, but an emergency because of the inability to deliver normally. Has mother had any narcotics within four hours of delivery? This would definitely lead us to believe we're at a high risk of resuscitation and be another red flag. So now, there's a lot of red flags we've identified. What are some of the reasons why we'd want to consider a scene delivery? Now, as I said before, ideally, 
Every birth could occur in a hospital. Wouldn't that be great? However, we don't live in the ideal world. We should consider scene delivery in any of the following situations. If we determine that the delivery is expected imminently. If the patient stating that she feels the need to push or bear down or move her bowels. If on physical exam we identify crowning. If mom's contractions are lasting over 45 to 60 seconds and are 1 to 2 minutes apart. Or if no appropriate transport unit is available. Now when I say no appropriate transport unit is available, if we've pulled up and while we're sitting there starting our evaluation on mom, our truck dies on us or blows a radiator hose or, well, breaks down. Or if we were having a mechanical failure on the way there and we were barely able to make it to the call. Or perhaps we're a non-transport, we're a first response unit, and we suddenly realize that we don't have a transport unit there, we may need to set up to deliver in the house. Another time would be extended transport time may be a factor. What about bad weather, winter weather, snow, ice, road conditions, trees down on the road, in the middle of a massive storm where we can't get to a hospital reliably, or we can get there but it may take two to three times as long as normal, or we need to delay due to distance. Our closest hospital may be an hour or two away, in which case we may have to do this at home. If we do, that's fine and we'll talk about how to prepare for it. There are also a few red flags for scene delivery. Now these red flags are largely centered around the fact that the doctor has told mom, hey look, you're not a good candidate or a candidate at all for a standard vaginal delivery. If it's going to be impossible, the birth plan may have been for a cesarean section. Mother may state that the placenta is implanted over the birth canal or the baby's in a very poor or breech position. The mother's medical history or anatomy may preclude the vaginal delivery, in which case, well, we're going to have to try to get to a hospital and we'll have to determine the best one that we can reach. But assuming we're going to deliver in the field, how do we prepare? Well, once we make that decision, we should begin preparing as quickly as possible for the not only delivery, but also a potential neonatal resuscitation. Ideally, planning for the worst, a fully blown neonatal resuscitation, will pay off big dividends in the unlikely event that it happens, and although a little bit of overkill can be too much, we want to make sure we're ready for anything that mom may throw at us. Now, our planning can fall into three key categories, equipment, personnel, and scene prep or scene setup. Our equipment. If we haven't already got our jump bag monitor and oxygen in the house, definitely we need that. If we have someone there or a bystander who can begin putting several towels in the dryer to warm them up a little bit, that would be great. Do we have our OB kit in the house or any additional PPE, gowns, goggles, splash shields, anything like that? Now would be a time to get it out. Do we have a neonatal BVM in the house with us just in case we need it, as well as our airway or intubation roll? Portable suction equipment. How about a spare oxygen cylinder? And does that spare cylinder have a spare regulator on it? Remember, we have one patient now. We may have two or more very quickly. If we need spare oxygen, spare cylinders, or an additional regulator, do we have a first response unit or a second in unit that can get it for us? Do we have any pediatric meds that we may need brought in the house? Again, we don't use them all the time. We may need to get that or some reference material. A good chance to glance through your neonatal medication preparation. Think about how am I going to mix D10? Or do I have time now to pre-mix D10 or at least review it very quickly? How to make D10 from D50 if we don't carry it. Things like this are all in the equipment preparation phase. Now let's look at personnel. In the perfect world, we may be able to get an additional unit with more manpower. But if we can't, can we get at least a QRV or a first response unit? Other public safety personnel? Is the local fire department trained at the EMR level or EMT level? Can they assist? We may need to delegate tasks out. Typically, we'll break it down where the lead provider will be focusing on the delivery. He or she will prep for the delivery, assist mom with the delivery, and be the lead for the resuscitation. The secondary provider will be primarily dealing with mom. They'll 
Get the mom on monitor. Monitor baseline vital signs at least every 10 minutes, more often if you think necessary. Establish an IV, normal saline, at least a KVO line or an INT, and maybe even consider a second IV as an INT if time allows. We'll get mom on the monitor and lead to get a baseline strip printed and all these wonderful things done because if we've got five minutes to prep, we should be able to get most of this accomplished. As far as our scene prep goes, we'll determine where and what position mom wants to deliver in. Most will want either supine with some support behind her back. She may decide to go on her side. If she wants to go on her side, we'll go with the left recumbent. We don't want to go right recumbent because that could possibly include the inferior vena cava. Mom may want to do it supine off the edge of the bed. That's fine too. In some cases, mom will actually want to deliver from a standing position. It is considered to be acceptable, however, less likely and less common. Now, we'll try to lay towels under mom's buttocks and then drape over mom's legs with a sterile drape, and we want to keep her privacy and her modesty in our mind as much as possible. However, we do need to make sure we're ready to deliver. Now, when it comes time for delivery, if we have a typical cephalic presentation, most of what we'll be doing is just assisting the delivery, sort of coaching mom along. We'll want to control the delivery speed, provide a gentle pressure and resistance to avoid a precipitous delivery. As the newborn's head emerges, provide support as it turns. We shouldn't be turning the head dramatically or pulling on the head, but again, just providing needed support. If we notice that the membranes are still covering the head and face as it emerges, we'll need to gently tear the sac away with our fingers. If the airway appears to be obstructed, we may need to cradle and support the newborn's head and clear the airway by suctioning with a bulb syringe. Remember, it's usually mouth first, then nose. We'll gently guide the head downward to allow the upper shoulder to the liver and clear the pubic bone, and then guide the head upward to deliver the lower shoulder. As the baby is delivered, we'll make a quick assessment. Does this appear to be a full-term gestation? Does the baby exhibit good muscle tone, movement, and activity? Is the baby breathing or crying adequately? If the answer to all three of these is yes, the infant can likely stay with the mother and will provide nothing but supportive care. However, if the answer to any of these questions is no, we need to begin working towards neonatal resuscitation. Now, the first phase of our care will begin by suctioning, drying, warming, and stimulating the neonate. This is where those warm towels come in. Likely, we'll go through two or three towels, and the fact that they're warm will help conserve body heat for the neonate. Remember, the baby for the last eight to nine months has been living in an apartment that's about 98.6 degrees inside, so the baby will be getting quite a shock coming out into the real world cold and wet. So we need to make sure we dry and stimulate the baby well. Most neonates don't require much support beyond this level, routine care. We'll assess the neonate typically at about 30 seconds in. We'll want to look primarily at the heart rate. If the heart rate is under 60, we should initiate aggressive care with CPR and bag valve ventilation. If the heart rate is between 60 and 100, the infant may require mild supportive care possibly additional stimulation or blow by oxygen. They may need to be coached a little bit to get into this whole breathing thing. If the heart rate's already over 100, primarily supportive care, we can initiate our APGAR scoring and let mom hold the baby. Now, we'll go look at meconium for a second. There's no way to know if meconium will be present until the amniotic sac actually breaks. Meconium, by definition, is the baby's first bowel movement, and it will typically be greenish or black in consistency and have a thick, gummy, tar-like consistency. Meconium staining is typically an indicator of fetal distress. Meconium may complicate patient management. So now, let's think for a second. Not only is it an indicator that the baby was in distress prior to delivery, that's a red flag, number two, it may complicate our management of the patient another red flag. So meconium can be a big red flag on two aspects. Now, if we have meconium, but the neonate is vigorous with good respiratory effort and good muscle tone, 
Likely, they won't benefit from suctioning at all. They should stay with the mother, receive the initial steps of newborn care, and may need a little gentle clearing of the meconium from the mouth and nose with the bulb syringe. However, if we find meconium and the baby is exhibiting signs of fetal distress, poor muscle tone, poor respiratory effort, respiratory distress, we should begin initiating resuscitation. We should start with positive pressure ventilation if the heart rate is less than 100 and consider intubation for respiratory distress. We no longer intubate solely for the purpose of suctioning. However, if we do have to intubate the neonate, we may need to suction at that time. As far as the umbilical cord, we're going to handle the cord with care to avoid damaging it. Once it stops pulsating, we need to tie or clamp the cord. Now, we can tie or clamp it at least four to five inches from the neonate and then two inches beyond that. So let's say at five and seven inches from the baby. However, I have talked to some of the OB docs and a lot of them say, I'll never complain if you leave me too much cord. Just don't leave me too little. So uh, while five and seven may be great, I'm sure that six and eight would be fine too. I'm sure at seven and nine or seven and ten would also be acceptable. Just make sure we leave at least five inches from the neonate for our first clamp. We want to then cut the cord between the clamps and monitor the ends of the cord for bleeding. If we do see bleeding from the cord, we'll need to clamp another proximal to the first. Assuming that the umbilical cord is managed, that should be fine. Now, if we have to delay cord clamping or wait 30 seconds after to clamp, it should have stopped pulsating. This will also help reducing interventricular hemorrhage. It will help reduce hypertension, reduce the need for transfusions after birth, and reduce necrotizing enterocolitis inflammation of the digestive tract. So all of these good reasons why we'll delay clamping the cord. Now, we've gone about 30 seconds to a minute in, at 1.30, we should reassess the baby. Is the heart rate still under 60? If it is, more aggressive care. We're already doing ventilations and CPR. We may want to consider intubation or look for treatable causes, such as blood sugar, because mom be on some medications. What do we know? As far as mom's medications, maybe need Narcan for the baby. I hate to say it, in this day and age, it's very possible. However, if the heart rate is now between 60 and 100, we'll continue to stimulate with blow by oxygen, maybe coach ventilations with the BVM a little bit. And again, as long as the heart rate's over 100, we stay in that green supportive care loop on the far side. At the 2.30 mark, again, we'll start going down each one of these depending on where the baby's heart rate is. We may now be looking at either an IV or an IO, we may be looking at if the heart rate's between 60 and 100. Well, considering intubation, if we still can't get it up, if BVM ventilations aren't helping. And again, heart rate over 100, supportive care. Now, if the heart rate was 62 and is now 98, well, we may not need to intubate at this point. But if the heart rate is 50 and falling, we're definitely going to be in the aggressive care section. And a lot of this will be trend analysis. As we get to the 330 mode, now we're going to be considering epinephrine if we're still under 60. May consider compressions if we're still under 100, although it's not likely. And if we're still over 100, we're looking again, maintaining body temperature, maintain warmth, allowing mom to hold the baby. Very much supportive care at that point. Now let's talk about neonatal pharmacology for a minute. Neonatal care rarely gets to this point. Most patients respond far before we get to this level. However, if we do need to administer medications, we need to make sure the dosing regimens are correct. In some cases, medications may need to be specially diluted for use in neonates. I know one agency that would put little laminated cards in their OB kits with a neonatal drug cheat sheet on it. Why? Because if you were in the OB kit, there was a possibility that you'd need this and they wanted to have it readily available in the case of a neonatal resuscitation. Seems like a good idea. Two of the meds we'll talk about for neonatal pharmacology, epinephrine. Epinephrine is given primarily for refractory bradycardia. 
That would be bradycardia that persists despite everything else we've done. It's still not getting any better or it's getting worse. The concentration we'll use is 0.1 milligram per ml. So the 1 to 10,000 that you'd have typically in a pre-fill cardiac arrest type syringe. The dose, however, for IV or IO use is 0 0.02 milligrams per kilogram. And you repeat this every about 3 to 5 minutes for bradycardia as long as it persists. If you have to go down the ET route, although it's not a primary consideration, it is acceptable, you'd give 0.1 milligram per kg. Again, that's primarily an option if you can't get an IV or an IO established. As a volume expander, we'll typically use normal saline in the pre-hospital arena. The dosing for this is 10 mLs per kg for each bolus, administered over 5 to 10 minutes. Now, you may need to repeat the bolus a time or two based on patient condition, and that's normal. Again, these are things that, if you haven't looked them up in a while, think about what syringe would you use? How would you dilute things? How would you pull this up out of a prefill syringe? This is where planning and working through it in advance can pay you big dividends if your next call is an OB delivery. Now, let's look at multiple gestations. Now, multiple gestations is commonly a term used to refer to any additional baby, whether it's twins, triplets, quadruplets, or who knows. But let's just look at the twins for a second. They may be on the same placenta, they may be on separate placentas, they may be in the same amniotic sac, or they may be in different amniotic sacs. Many times you'll see that a single placenta for two babies. However, keep in mind that there may be a separate placenta. So if you have a multiple gestation, you may need to account for two placentas. Dealing with multiple gestations is usually pretty simple. We'll deliver as normal, but recognize a few of the key differences. Number one, the situation can change very quickly. We're dealing with potentially three or more critical patients. Mom and baby weren't enough. No, now we've got two babies. Typically, we know that multiples are born prematurely in many cases and have respiratory compromise as a result. They also may have low birth weight as a result of being born prematurely and as a result of how much food they're able to get through the placenta or nutrition they're able to get through the placenta. So if mom says that she's having multiple, we need to keep in mind, okay, premature, high risk for resuscitation, low birth weight, and this would definitely be a reason to look for additional personnel and definitely a reason for a second truck or second apparatus out there with you. Another complication we'll address is prolapse cord. In this case, the cord is extended from the cervix out and is thus in the way of the delivery in some cases. Now, if the baby tries to come out through there, we try to deliver the baby, even if we were delivering head first, we're going to clamp or occlude the cord and thus just keep off the baby's, cut off the baby's oxygen. So we definitely need to transport immediately in this case in either Trendelenburg or knee chest position to keep the weight of the baby off of the cord. We may need to insert our two glove fingers into the vaginal canal to again keep the cord from being clamped, keep it from being crimped, or keep the weight of the baby from occluding their own airway. We need to keep any exposed cord moist with sterile dressings. We don't want to pull on the cord or attempt reinsertion as this could either cause significant bleeding, damage to the cord, or induce a significant amount of infection to the mom. Another complication we may see is shoulder dystocia. This is where the impact of the shoulders at the pelvic outlet. The anterior or top shoulder is typically lodged against the pubic symphysis. This may lead not only to brachial injury for the baby or clavicle fracture, but fetal hypoxia from being stuck in the birth canal. It may be indicated by the head presenting and then contracting. When the baby is presenting, we know the baby is being squeezed to come through the birth canal, but is that squeeze going on? Is it now such a squeeze that the baby is unable to take a deep breath or get oxygen? Well, this could be problematic. We need to initiate the McRoberts maneuver. In this case, the mother will put her buttocks off the end of the bed with her thighs flexed upward. 
will apply a firm pressure with your hand above the pubic bone or above the pubic symphysis, hopefully to be able to relieve the pressure and get the baby to clear the shoulder. If this fails to deliver the baby, we need to initiate immediate transport. Now the procedure is shown here, and as you can see, the provider is pushing downward across the top of the pubic bone to get the baby underneath it to help clear the pubic bone so the baby doesn't get caught half in, half out. Now, nuchal cord is a condition where the umbilical cord becomes wrapped or encircled around the baby's neck. This is fairly common and occurs in about 30% of all births and represents one of the most problems we'll see in the field. Ideally, using one to two fingers, we can loop the cord over the infant's neck or maneuver it off the neck and clear it very easily. However, if we're unable to clear it, we need to carefully clamp and cut the cord. I stress carefully, as we'll be potentially using very sharp tools right next to the baby's neck, and, well, this is another time when I'd much rather be doing it in the house sitting still than moving down the road in the back of an ambulance running emergent to the hospital. Somehow I just think this would be a better idea. As you can see here from this diagram, if the baby begins to deliver, the cord's going to cinch up around the baby's neck and not only could preclude delivery, but could also complicate things much further if the cord gets damaged. Now let's talk about APGAR scoring for a minute. APGAR score has been around since 1952 and was developed by Dr. Virginia APGAR. She was an anesthesiologist. It remains one of the best ways to assess the condition of a neonate. It grades five separate factors, each of which on a 0 to 2 scale, to arrive at a 0 to 10 scale for the baby overall. At a minimum, it should be obtained at 1 and 5 minutes after delivery. However, I've seen several agencies and providers continue it every 5 minutes thereafter. So, for example, at 1, 5, and then at 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes. It grades the baby on a very simple scale, and it's very simple to remember. If you don't have a cheat sheet for this, this would be another one that could be great to stuff in your OB kits, just in case, because I promise you, you won't remember this and you won't have a chance to reference it real quickly when you're grading a neonate. Now, each of the five signs in the first column, heart rate, respiratory effort, muscle tone, reflexes, and color are graded. You can see the different scores across as we go and that will give our baby somewhere between our 0 and 10. Now, 7 to 10 is fairly normal, 4 to 6 is moderately depressed, and 0 to 3 needs immediate resuscitation procedures. So, so far, so good. Taking what we have at the 1 minute and taking what we have at the 5 minute can also give us an excellent trend analysis. For example, if the baby was a 4 or 5 on the first one, and is a 7 or an 8 on the second one, we know we're doing great. However, if the baby was a 4 or 5 on the first one, and is barely a 3 on the next one, we know we're not doing well and we need to get more aggressive. Now, when we talk about placentas, the delivery of the placenta, or placentas, occurs in the third phase of labor, typically within 5 to 30 minutes of the newborn's arrival, and the mother may state it feels like she's in labor again. She may feel contractions or identify that it feels like she's having contractions. Now, we shouldn't delay transport of the mother or the neonate for the placenta to deliver. However, we do want to make sure that we can collect and bag the placenta for transport with the mother to the hospital, if at all physically possible. As I mentioned with multiple gestations, in some cases there may be multiple placentas, so please keep that in the back of your mind. Now, we've talked a lot about the baby, but let's talk about mom for a minute. She's been through a lot. Throughout the labor process, one crew member should be assigned and dedicated to support the mother and monitor her. Once the placenta delivery has been completed, this provider can assist mom, potentially massaging the fundus of the upper part of the uterus to assist in controlling hemorrhage. She can assist in um, monitoring postpartum bleeding and allow the other providers to focus on neonatal resuscitation. Now, ideally, postpartum bleeding should be less than 500 mLs. However, if it's more or continues to be significantly more, 
this would be a time when we'd be really happy we have that IV line or that INT lock already established. Another thing that we need to consider with mom is, even if in a perfect delivery she's only lost about 500 mLs of blood, she still has lost a significant amount and possibly some other fluid volume as well. She may be hypotensive and also very uh, key towards lightheadedness, dizziness, or vertigo if she tries to stand up. So make sure, even if things are going well, that we're taking care of mom and we're making sure that she doesn't try to stand up too quickly or do something. Make sure there's someone assigned to her to take care of her and she take, you know, make sure things work out well on her end so we don't have mom collapse on us because that would, you know, further complicate our scene. Now let's talk about some presentations. Ideally, as you'll see on the left there, we get a head first or cephalic presentation. However, we may get any type of breach presentation, whether it be a buttocks presentation or a transverse breach. Typically, most babies are going to present normally. However, 3 to 5% of the full-term gestation babies present as breach, so about 1 out of 20. We can have a frank breach where the child's legs are up to the abdomen and the feet are near the, e feet are near the ears. We can have a complete or a flexed breach where the baby's cross-legged, bent at the knees and hips, or a footling breach where one or more feet present first. This may be common in some premature births where the baby hasn't had a chance to rotate. In a kneeling breach, we'd have the knees presenting first. Many times, based on this presentation, it will further complicate the delivery. With this case, we need to promptly transport to avoid a field delivery, or if a field delivery is unavoidable, do your best to support the buttocks and legs. We don't want to pull on anything, but we need to make sure that we're transporting expeditedly, especially if the head hasn't delivered within two to three minutes. We may need to even insert a gloved hand into the vagina and use our fingers to create a V over the infant's nose and mouth to help clear an airway. We'll push the vaginal wall away from the nose and mouth to facilitate air from the outside, making it to the baby's face so they can breathe. Now, a limb presentation would be where one or more one arm or leg presents first. We don't want to touch the limb or stimulate it, and we don't want to attempt delivery. We'll provide transport, typically in a knee chest position, and get to the closest facility. In closing, while emergent deliveries in the field are rare, they can present a very simple situation but become complicated very quickly based on the risk factors we discussed. Providers must remember if the decision is made to deliver in the field, the situation can become very resource intensive. It may take more. Again, we're dealing with multiple patients, mom and the baby or babies. A good assessment and triage can help providers anticipate and prepare for complications, and again, pre-planning in advance for this can definitely pay big dividends. Hey there, I'd like to thank you all for stopping by checking out our video. If you want more information about our company or any of the stuff we do, you can check out our website. If you need EMS Continuing Education Hours, we do have our online education platform posted up there. Also, we have our email address if you have any questions. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Rumble. We maintain channels on all of those. Also, please like, share this out to your friends, subscribe, help support the channel, and we'll keep putting more videos out there for you. Oh, well, enough about that. I know what I'm up for. Time for a cup of coffee. Y'all have a great day. Be safe out there. Bye. Thank you.